Morning, good to see everybody. Thanks for coming out today on this day. How many of you have said Happy New Year to somebody so far? How many have somebody said Happy New Year to you so far? So how are we so far? Happy. <laughs> happy, all right. Happy, happy. So let me ask this question. I mean, really and truly, would you like to have a happy new year? Yes. Would you like to have a joyful new year? Yes. A more peaceful new year? A more meaningful new year? One person? Yes. By the way, if you're joining us online today, the same question is for you. Would you like to have a happier new year, a better new year, a more peaceful, more joyful new year? And my guess would be yes. Not a trick question. So thanks for joining us and just listen in on what God says to you today. The rest of us that are in the room, would you stand to your feet this morning? Please. I know you're comfortable. Don't mean to wake you, but let's stand together. And I want to ask you to pray something very simple for yourself. And that is, ask God to speak to you today. If there really is a God, we believe there is, and He's alive, and He does speak, and He is involved in our lives, would you ask Him to speak to you this morning? Very simple request. If you're brave enough, bow your head, close your eyes, ask Him to speak to you this morning. That didn't take long. Ask Him to speak to the people around you. Ask him to speak to the people online. Those of you that are watching online, would you ask God to speak to us in this room? And then if you would be so brave, would you ask God to help you do what it is he says? Lord, you've heard our prayers this morning. We ask that you would help us to do what we're asking, that you would speak to us and that we would listen and we would do what you say in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Let me begin our new year, new service today with a question, and that is this question, what is it all about? What is life about? Why are we here? Why are you here? Where are we going? What do we do until we get to where we're going? Some of the most fundamental questions that we can ask ourselves in life. How many of you know or you suspect that God wants you to grow spiritually. Once you have accepted Christ as your Savior, you have been forgiven of your sins, Christ comes into your life, He wants you to keep going. That's not the finish line, that's the beginning. The gun just went off, and now He wants you to learn how to follow Him. He wants you to get to know Him, He wants you to trust Him, He wants you to follow Him. How many of you believe that's true? I believe that's true. Let's see what He says in His book. I'm in the Bible. And today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what's called a survey. I'm not going to go deep on any of these. I'm going to go wide. I'm going to show you some things. And the idea is to communicate to you, with you, just how prevalent these ideas are, where they're found in the Bible. Go back and look at them more deeply and study them, pray about them, talk to God about them. But this morning, we're just going fast, okay? So I am in 1 Peter chapter 2. The question on the table is this, does God want you to grow spiritually? First uh, Peter chapter two verse two says, "Like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word. Why? So that by it you may grow in respect to salvation." What is Peter saying? Grow. You've got to long for it. The word of God is the object. That's what you're to long for. If you turned over one chapter in chapter three of Second Peter, verse chapter three verse eighteen, he says, "But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ." If you turn back to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, this is what he says. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about the Christ, in other words, the very basics, let us press on to maturity. The idea is there's a time to be a child and then there's a time to grow up, to be a teenager and then an adult. Even in your faith is like that. That's the idea there. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, he says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So, he wants us to grow. In fact, the whole New Testament, once you get past the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's the story of Jesus. Acts is the story of the beginning of the church and the spread of Christianity for the first 30 years in the first century. 
When you get past that, all of the letters from then on to churches and individuals are basically designed to challenge and encourage individuals and communities, churches, to grow, to follow God, to go deeper, to go further, to be more obedient and grow in their faith. It is a major theme in the New Testament. This is not a small thing. It's not a side issue. It is a main theme. Now, here's the question. Another question is this. Why? Why does God want you to grow spiritually? Why is it important for you to grow spiritually? Lots of reasons. Let's see. What do you think might be the biggest reason of all? Let's see if we can, exactly. Let's see if we can find it in Ephesians chapter 1. Or, yeah, chapter 1. I'm in Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to look at this fast. In chapter 1, verse 5, it says this. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. To the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us and the Beloved. It's right there. The answer's right there in those two verses. If you didn't see it, let's see if you can see it in these next two verses. Same chapter, chapter of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 11 says, Also, we, having obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of a uh, purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. You see it yet? Okay, here's the third one. In verse 13, it says this. I mean, still in Ephesians, still in chapter 1, verse 13. In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession. Here it is, to the praise of his glory. If you're taking notes this morning, and I hope you are, your first fill in the blank is the reason God wants you to grow spiritually is for God's glory, for God's glory, for God's praise, for God's honor, right? Anytime something that the the creator created, when it does what it's supposed to do, it fulfills its purpose, it actually glorifies God. It glorifies God. That's the first and greatest reason why God wants us to grow spiritually. A second reason God wants us to grow spiritually is that our growth helps the church grow strong. Our personal growth helps the church grow strong. I'm still in Ephesians. Now I'm in chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. Here's what it says. It says, And he gave some as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. These are the gifts, the roles that God gave the church. What did he give them the church to the church for? He answers that question in verse 12. For the equipping of the saints. Who are the saints? The church. Anybody that's a Christian is a saint. That's another name for a Christian. So if you've accepted Christ as your Savior recently, when you were a kid, long ago, if you claim to be a Christian, he's talking to you right here. He's talking about you and to you. He says, God gives gifts to the church for the equipping of the saints. Why? For the work of the service, to the building up of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the church to build it up until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, right? And then he says, as a result, this is what's the the result of that is. In verse 14, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. What he's saying is that as the church is being built up, as you're being built up, part of the way God wants to build you up is he wants you to know the truth. He wants you to understand the truth, be able to discern the truth. Question for you, do we need to know the truth in the day in which we live? We needed, they apparently needed to know the truth in the day that Paul wrote this in the first century. There was a lot of deception in the world that day. There were a lot of people saying different things, part truth, part false, all false. But what Paul was trying to get them to see is there's a danger when you don't know what's real, what you don't know is true. We live in a day where this rules, doesn't it? How, much, how often do I go to Google? How often do I listen to a podcast? How often am I looking for information on the internet? Can I ask you a question? Is everything on the internet true? Is everything on the internet of equal value? Does every podcast I listen to, is that always the gospel, the absolute truth? No, it's not, okay? I'm not anti-internet. I'm not anti-Google. I'm not anti-podcast. I use all of those tools. But here's the thing. This right here is the source of truth. This is not an opinion. 
okay? This is not one opinion among many. This is God's opinion. This is his word. This is the truth. And he says, I want you to know the truth because if you know the truth, one of the benefits is you're going to be strong. You're not going to be taken under. You're not going to be deceived. You're going to know right from wrong. You're going to know the difference between what's false and what's true. The blatant stuff, but also the subtle stuff. You have to know what God says if you're going to know the truth. That is a lifetime pursuit. You can't do that over the weekend. You can't accomplish that in a month or a few months. That is a lifetime pursuit. That's the idea. God doesn't want us to be deceived. He wants us to know the truth so we can live the life that he's called us to. Now, question for you. Do your children need to know the truth? Not just get saved. Yes, they need they need Christ. They need to be saved. But they also need to know the truth from God, what he says, what's true, what's right, what's holy, what's the best. That's, these are reasons why God says, I want you to grow spiritually. It's important. Another reason, if you're taking notes, God wants you to grow spiritually is because of the temporariness of this life and this world. God wants you to grow spiritually because of the temporariness of this life and this world. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 17, Paul, uh, John wrote these words. He said, the world is passing away. You ever thought about that? Do you realize that? The world is passing away. And also it's lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. And I know you can be a young person, you know, a teenager or in your early 20s, just starting out, just getting your family together and that sort of thing. And this can seem depressing. It's kind of like, man, I didn't really want to hear that today. I, I came to church. I need some hope. I need some encouragement. And you're telling me that the world's passing away. What I'm telling you is this is what God's telling you. And the reason God's telling you that is so that you won't think that this life and this world is all that there is. God wants you to live your life, get married if you're supposed to get married, have kids if you're supposed to have kids, work your job, go to school, get your education, live your life, but don't live your life as though this life and this world is all there is. That is a tragic mistake. That is, I, I believe that is the second greatest mistake that a human being can make. I really do. Thinking that this life and this world is all there is. What's the first greatest mistake a person can make? Rejecting Jesus Christ. If you reject Christ, you reject truth. If you reject Christ, you reject your only way to be right with God the Father. That's why Jesus came and died on a cross and rose from the grave to defeat sin's power in your life and to give you the power to live the life that God calls you to live. That's why Jesus came. That's why this book is written and why it points toward Jesus Christ. Okay? So he wants you to realize there's more to life than just this life. There's more to life than just this world. There's more to life than just right now. And so don't let that depress you, but live with an understanding of the big picture in mind. This is headed somewhere. Where is it headed? Well, I'll tell you where it's headed. Well, I'll let God tell you where it's headed. I'm in 2 Peter now. I'm in chapter 3. I'm in verse 7. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 7 says this, But by his word the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. How did the earth, how was it destroyed the first time? Water, the flood, Genesis. You remember that? Some of you do, right? How is God going to destroy the earth the second time? By fire. This is where this is all headed. And you're like, great, thanks for the good news. I appreciate the tip. I feel a lot better now that this all ends in fire. Listen, if you don't know that, okay, then it's, it's worse. If you do know that, if you know where this is headed and you know how God wants you to respond to how things are going to turn out, then you're wise to do something with your life while you still have an opportunity. And by the way, what happens in the end? Let me go ahead and tell you that. Let the Bible tell you that. I'm in Revelation chapter 21. This is the next last chapter in the whole Bible. In, in Revelation 21 verse 1, John writes this. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. They, there's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Okay? And then he goes on and talks about how he's going to wipe away every tear. God is. And he's going to remove suffering and pain and sorrow and grief and all that kind of stuff. And we live happily ever after. I mean, more than we can possibly imagine. He finishes the Bible saying how good it's actually going to be for those of us who are Christians. And so when Peter says, hey, the earth's coming to an end, when John says, hey, the earth and its lusts are passing away, 
and he says, hey, the earth's going to end in fire. It's not going to end in fire for those of us who are born again. Those of us that have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, he is our savior. What has he saved us from? He saved us from sin, and he saved us from that fiery destruction that Peter writes about in 2 Peter. You're not going to be there if you have trusted Christ as your savior. This, is this, I mean, are we, are we on the page here together? Are you getting this? I mean, is this, does this make sense? I'm not making this up. I didn't write this. I didn't write any part of this. All I'm doing is saying, why does God want us to grow spiritually? He wants us to grow spiritually because it glorifies him. When you do what you're designed to do on the earth, it brings praise and glory to God. That's one. God wants you to grow spiritually because your growth spiritually makes the church stronger. It makes you stronger. It makes everybody around you stronger, right? God wants you to grow spiritually because this life is not all there is. This world is not all there is. If you make the mistake of putting all your eggs in this world's basket, you're going to be sorely disappointed because there's something so much better than this. Question for you. Where are you going to be 10,000 years from right now? Somewhere. Somewhere, you're not going to cease to exist. You will be in heaven or hell. That's it. That's all there is. And God is saying to you, he's saying to me, I don't want any of you in hell. Hell's a real place. I created it for the people who'd reject my son. My son is my offer to you for forgiveness of your sins. He's the only one that can do it for you. But you have to accept him. You have to believe in him. And once you do, things change for the better. That's what he's saying, okay? He doesn't want you there. Fourth reason why God wants us to grow spiritually. Here it is. God wants us to grow spiritually so that we can give our best selves, our best selves to the world now. Give our best selves to the world now. Give your spouse, if you're married, the best version of you. Give your children the best version of you. Give your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, the people you go to school with, the people on your team, right? The people that you work with, your friends, your church, your God. Give all of these the very best version of you. And why would we want to do that? First of all, it gives glory to God when you do that. Second of all, it's beneficial for you. When you give yourself to God, when He's in charge of you, it's not for God's benefit. It's for your benefit. God is self-existent. God is eternal. God is sovereign. Everything belongs to Him. He created everything, and it all belongs to Him, and it's all going to return to Him. Okay? And so, unlike you too, He can live with or without you. He doesn't need anything from you. You and I have got to stop thinking that God somehow benefits from our obedience to him and our spiritual growth. He doesn't. God no, no, God wants you to grow spiritually for what it does in your life and what it does in the lives of the people around you. Here's how it works. And here's why he wants you to grow. If you accept his son as your savior, you're forgiven of your sins, past, present, and future. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. It's in Revelation, and it can never be taken out. In other words, you're in the family. You can't get kicked out of the family. Nobody can kick you out of the family. You can't even remove yourself from the family of God. You're in, right? So while you're here, though, okay, while you're living your life on this this earth, he wants you to get to know his son. If you have been under the mistaken idea so far that you get saved and Jesus is your get out of hell free card, and then you just sort of live your life however you want, go where you want, do what you want, date who you want, watch what you want, think what you want, say what you want, behave how you want to behave, and your life has nothing to do with Jesus, you're making a tragic mistake. Jesus saved you to transform you, utterly transform you from the inside out. He wants the very best version of you. And how it works is you accept him, you begin to follow him, you begin, or get to know him. You get to know him through his word. You get to know who he's about. What, he, what did he say? What did he teach? What does he want? What does he expect? Where is this all headed? He will reveal these things to you as you get to know him. Here's what you find. The more you get to know him, the more you want to love him. You cannot help yourself. You will fall in love with Jesus. He's already in love with you. He died for you before you were born. That's how in love he he is with you. Okay? That's a settled issue. But he wants you to love him back. And so as you get to know him, you'll fall in love with him. As you fall in love with him, and I'm not trying to be weird here. I'm saying this is a relationship with a person, with God. As you fall in love with him, you will want to follow him. You realize 
that what he wants is the very best for you. Not just stuff from you, but for you. He wants the best for you. He wants the best version of you. As you learn to follow him, it changes everything about you. With Christ as the center point of your life, when Christ is really who you're about, when he is your primary pursuit in life, it changes everything about you. Your perspective on God changes. Your perspective on yourself changes. Your perspective on people change. Your perspective on life changes, circumstances, up times, down times, boring times. You know, your, your perspective corrects. It gets corrected by God's word. That's what happens over time. This is part of the reason God wants you to grow spiritually and become the very best version of you. By the way, the very best version of you leads to your most effective evangelism. The very best version of you is the clearest, greatest representation of him. The best version of you as you learn Jesus and you follow him, what you find is everything about you gets better. You make better decisions, okay? The people around you benefit from your wise choices. You stop making so many dumb choices, or at least you make less than you used to make, right? That's part of letting Jesus Christ grow you and lead you and you're following him. Everything changes for the better when Jesus is Lord of your life, but it doesn't happen just automatically. You can't just show up at church every once in a while and think that you're following Jesus, not according to what his word says. His word says that following him is to be the number one pursuit of your life. It's not secondary. It's not third or fourth or 18th. After you do this and I figure out my career and I decide who I want to marry, if I want to get married and I decide, you know, if I'm going to date or I decide I'm going to start a business or I decide I'm going to go to college or, and then when I get all that in place, then I'll start following Jesus. That is exactly the reciprocal of how you should approach life according to the Bible. If you make Jesus Lord of your life, if you will focus on him, if you will pursue him, he will transform you from the inside out. He will give you the power to do what it is that he wants you to do. And you will not be disappointed. You will not be disappointed. Will it turn out different than you thought it was going to? Guaranteed. Will you have some sad times, hard times? Guaranteed. But what you will find is over time, he will take you places He will do things in your life. He will do things in your thinking, in your perspective, in your motives, in what you value. He will transform you into the best version of yourself from the inside out. But it takes time. It takes time. Anybody want to go? Do you want that? Do you want his best version? Do you want to grow spiritually? Do you want to glorify him? Do you want to stop being deceived and in the dark? Do you want to help build the church? Do you want the best version of yourself? Anybody? You online? Anybody? Okay, the next question is this. You may say to yourself, heck yeah, you had me, you know, 10 minutes ago, but you just keep talking about this. I'm in. What do I do? What's the next thing? What is my next step? Okay, I'm glad you asked. Here's the question. What if we could all start fresh in 2022? What if you could begin for the first time to purposely start following Jesus? And I know a lot of you already are. I know you already follow Jesus. You know Jesus. You're following Jesus. You're growing spiritually. You understand the benefits of it. And what I would say to you is don't stop. Don't get lazy. Don't think that you've accomplished a certain level and that's all there is. Push yourself. Allow God to push you. There's so much more he wants to do in your life. You say, well, I'm retired. I'm 90 years old. Well, okay. You're still alive. God still has more for you. If you, listen, here's the mistake we make most of the time. This is the mistake I make most of the time. I view what God will or will not do based on me instead of him. And I miss, therefore, I miss his best so often. I think maybe you might struggle with the same thing. Well, he couldn't use me because, and you fill in the blank. No, no, no. He has way more for you. You simply have to be attentive. You have to pursue him, pay attention, and watch and see what he does. So what I would like to propose for us to do is let's, let's do this. Let's pretend like. Are you any good at pretending? Let's pretend like we all just got saved, all right? And I know maybe you've been saved a long time, and you're like, ah, I don't know about that. But I want you to picture in your mind yourself as a brand new believer. You're a brand new believer. You just met Jesus, Okay. What would you do next? And I understand this. I I realize that some of you have never been trained how to follow Jesus. 
Maybe most of us in the room, most of you watching online, you've never been trained in how to follow Jesus. Maybe, maybe you got saved at a young age or maybe at an old age and just the, the church that you went to, they just didn't have anything for you. There was nobody there to disciple you, nobody there to train you. Okay, what do you do next? What's the next step? What's the first step? The next step, the next step. And so through no fault of your own, and I'm not throwing rocks at you or anybody else, but that's just the way it was. Maybe you had a little bit of training. Maybe long ago you accepted Christ and you had some training, but you forgot what you learned. You don't do that anymore. You know, for whatever reason, you've not really been following Jesus. And that's okay. What if we pretended like we just got saved and now we're going to start following Jesus from the starting point, from the beginning? If you've never been trained in how to follow Jesus, that's what we're going to do up through Easter. And we're not going to stop at Easter, but we're going to do some different things come Easter. But we're going to continue this path. We're going to help you learn how to follow Jesus. How many of you have ever heard the statement that work smarter, not harder? You've ever heard the statement work smarter, not harder? Do you know that principle applies to your spiritual growth as well? It absolutely does. How does it apply to your growth? If we practice certain habits, we increase our chance in how to grow. And what are habits? Everybody in the room and you watching online, you know what habits are. Habits are the things you do over and over and over again. I wake up at a certain time, maybe. I get up, I eat my breakfast, I brush my teeth, I take a shower, I put on deodorant, whatever it is I do. I do habitually. The things that I do over and over and over again, those are habits. If you wanted to establish a new habit, if you wanted to establish a new behavior in your life, how would you do that? Here's what statistics show us in habits, how they form. If you, you can form a new habit in 66 days. If you do the same thing repetitively for 66 days, roughly two months, you will establish a new habit. And this is what's important about habits. It's not, it's not good just to have a habit. You need to establish the right habits, okay? How many of you have heard practice makes perfect? Let me see your hand. Practice makes perfect. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. I've practiced playing golf for years and years and years since high school. I have paid two different instructors to teach me how to play golf better. You know how much better I am than I was maybe in high school? Not. Practice doesn't make perfect. Let me tell you what practice does make. Practice makes permanent. That's what it does. So if you learn how to do something the wrong way, guess what? You continue to do it the wrong way. If you learn how to do something the right way, you do it the right way, okay? Especially, again, if you're trying to form a new habit, 66 days, two months, new behavior, I do it consistently, not perfectly, but consistently for a couple of months. What I will find is after the couple of months are over, I have now established a new behavior that has become a habit. Now I don't have to think about it. I just do it. I just instinctively do what it is that I have learned to do. I was reading a book a few years ago by a guy named Charles Duhigg. It's called The Power of Habits. Fascinating book. He talks all about what they are, when they started, how they work, what triggers, all that kind of stuff. Fascinating book. In the book, he talks about something called keystone habits. Keystone habits are habits that you have that impact other areas of your life. Okay? Let me give you an example of of a keystone habit. A keystone habit is exercise. All right? It's a new year. Many of you are thinking, I need to lose weight. I need to get in shape. I want to tone up. Whatever your goal is, but it involves exercise. And so, what do you do? You get up, and maybe you've got a home gym, and you work out at your house. Maybe you have a membership at a gym somewhere. You go there, and so you work on whatever area you're targeting. You put in the reps, the sweat equity. As soon as you're done working out, do you get off the exercise machine and go out back and have a smoke? Is that, is that what you do after you work out? Why are y'all looking at me like I'm speaking in French? (laughs) Is that what you do after you work out? How about this one? Let me help you. Maybe that was hard. How about this one? After you work out, do you jump in your automobile, run down to the donut shop, and have three glazed and three chocolates for breakfast? Is that what you do after you work out? No, you don't. Exercise is a keystone habit in that if you choose to work out, you tend to eat better. You tend to think more clearly. You tend to have more energy. You tend to sleep better. It's a keystone habit, and it works this way. You make a good decision here, it leads to a good decision here, leads to a good decision here, and so forth and so on. Bad habits work the same way, okay?
Okay? So what we're talking about is how do we establish some good habits that are going to help us grow spiritually? Here's a statement for you. The right habits have the potential to produce epic results over time. The right habits have the potential to produce epic results over time. And this is what Pastor Rob and I want to do this next year. We want to spend some time helping you develop some habits that will help you learn to follow Jesus, train you how to follow Jesus. And I know what many of you are thinking, and those of you online, you're thinking to yourself, that sounds good. I'd like to do that. I should do that. It'd be the best thing. I know, but I know me. And I know me, and I know that I'm not going to be able to make that change for the rest of my life. I know that it's likely that I won't keep it up. If I start it, I I won't finish it. Uh, What if I miss a day? What if I miss a couple of days? And so we talk ourselves out of establishing things that are actually good for us and help us get where we want to go before we ever even get started. So let me just say this to you. If you're doubting yourself, if you're doubting the process, if you've got hang-ups about why you can't do it or won't do it or stick with it or whatever, can I just say to you, if you want to grow spiritually, what we're going to do is take one habit one, not habit, but one practice each week, and we're going to, as best we can, describe it. Here's what it is. Here's how it works. Here's how you can do it, okay? We're not going to pile 10 on you at one time, right? One a week, and we'll just build on that week after week after week. And so you, and and here's the thing, here's the deal. You can decide, nah, I don't want to do that. It's okay. All this is voluntary. Understand that. But if you want to grow spiritually, God wants you to grow spiritually. If you want to grow spiritually, it's not magic. It's not just going to happen to you. I'm just going to live my life and I'm going to grow spiritually. No, you won't. You've got to decide to do some things to make yourself... Are you going to lose weight magically? Are you going to get in shape magically? Me and her are the only... Well, we got three here. No, you, you... it's, this is not rocket science. This is not like, I don't even, I don't know what he's talking about. It's so complicated. No, it's not. It's, it's really very simple. So we're going to just do one a week and you can look at it and you can say, you know, I think I can do that and give it a try and work on it. Okay. And then we'll build on that one the next week and we'll build on that one. And you can decide, Hey, I think I can do this. And you can actually establish some habits in your life that will bring about epic results this year. This year, not 20 years from now, it will be 20 years from now, but this year you can start seeing things. When we get to this, t- this time in 2023, right, and you're looking back over 2022, you can be a different person than you are. Amen. You can be a better version of yourself than you are. But please don't wait on fate. Please don't just think, well, it's just in the stars, it's just gonna happen. It's gonna happen. If you do your part, that's what God is saying to you. That's what he's saying to me. Do your part. And can I just say this? This right here is what I really feel like God wants me to do with my time here on earth, whatever I got left, okay? I, I, for the last year and a half, in prayer, usually in prayer, God's been speaking to me about what it is that he wants me to do, okay, as a pastor here at Foundation Church. What is our mission statement? Let's, let me do that first. To help people find and follow Jesus, okay? For the last few years, we've spent a lot of money, energy, time, effort focusing on helping people find Jesus, be saved, right? In 2022, we're going to continue that. We're going to expand on those efforts. But what's the second part of our mission statement? To help people follow Jesus. That's what I sense God is really calling me to do. Okay, I'm supposed to, with whatever next season I have, I'm supposed to help people learn how, train people in how to follow Jesus Christ. That's what I feel called to do. God's been showing me different pieces of this. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. I'll be praying and he'll say, here's a piece. Another day, a week goes by, a couple of weeks go by, here's another piece, here's another piece. And he's building this framework, this model in my mind. And let me just tell you something, that's not me. I don't operate that way. It has to be of God because that's not how I've lived my life. That's not how I've shepherded. That's not who I am. But this is what he's saying to me now. And and here's what I can tell you. What's about to happen is we're going to make a change, and I'm going to announce that here in just a second. But, But here's the thing. How many of you know I have MS? I have multiple sclerosis, okay? I was diagnosed with MS in 2017, and I was in really bad shape. And you're probably looking at me going, well, not much has changed. But 
But I was in real bad shape and to the point that I did not know if I could continue to be a pastor anymore. Uh, and so anyway, that's another story. In the midst of that, I, Pastor Rob and I got to know each other. We were talking. He was feeling called out of where he was, and he felt like God was calling him here. He left a mega church to come to a mini church, and, and, and so we knew God was in it, and we didn't know exactly what we were going to do and what it was going to look like, but from day one, this is what I knew I was supposed to do. God made it very clear to me. He said to me, he said, look, your role now is to help Rob. Your role is to run blocker for him. Your role is to help him to be the most effective pastor that he can possibly be. That's what you're supposed to do. And so that's what I've been doing for the last three and a half years. And for the last three and a half years, he and I have been co-pastoring Foundation Church. How many of you, that's like a total surprise to you? I had no idea. You mean Rob's a pastor here? Yeah, he is. He's been doing the things that God's called him to do. I've been doing the things that God's called me to do. And so today we want to make a change. Officially, from this day forward, we're going to start doing what we've been doing. For the, we're going to basically give our t- change our titles. What we've been doing the last three and a half years, we're going to continue to do. I'm no longer going to be lead pastor of Foundation Church from this day forward. I'm going to be co-pastor with Rob. Rob's no longer going to be associate pastor at Foundation Church. He's going to be co-pastor with Scott. So if you say, yeah, they didn't clap in the first service. I don't know what that means. I could take that a lot of different ways. (laughs) Finally, the old guy is going. He's got one foot in the grave. Yeah, maybe. But let me me just say this. Um, What we're going to do is we're going to continue doing what we've been doing the last three and a half years. What's going to be different in the day-to-day operations of Foundation Church? Nothing. What we've been doing, we're going to continue to do. What will change a little bit is my role is going to focus more on helping believers more and more. You know, Rob, if you know anything about Rob, he's an evangelist at heart. He loves to see people get saved. Not that I don't, but I don't have that same gift. But listen, that guy, if he goes to your birthday party, if he's at Walmart, if he's in the bathroom, wherever he is, he wants to give an invitation. Because he wants to see people come to Christ. Not because he's weird, but because that's a gift that God's given him. And you know what? That's why we've seen so many people come to Christ. Not that Rob has saved them, but God has worked through his life and continues to work through his life. And we're hoping we'll continue to work through his life in seeing new people come to Christ. Somebody has got to come behind all those new people and help them learn how to follow Jesus. So they don't just slip through the cracks and disappear. That is my role going forward. So I'm coming after you. Okay? So it's not a threat, but I just want you to understand that what we're going to be doing is we're going to be developing things, putting some things in place, and offering some opportunities to you to learn how to follow Jesus in very basic ways. But I'm telling you, if you'll do certain things, you'll be a different person. You'll be a better person. You absolutely will. And let me just say this. If you're sitting there, you're going, okay, what's the truth? Give, give me the skinny. Don't, don't, don't give me the, the you know, spun version. Tell me what's really going on. Are they trying to push you out? Not to my knowledge. I mean, I, I don't know of any secret coups or anything like that. It's just that what we've been doing, we're going to continue to do, as I just got through saying. And um, I think it's going to hopefully bless the church here at Foundation Church. That's what we see. How many of you understand plurality of leadership? Do you know what that is? Plurality means more than one. The New Testament, the Bible teaches plurality of leadership. So we have pastors here at Foundation Church, right? Who's the pastor at Foundation Church? Me and Rob. Rob's the pastor. Scott's the pastor. Scott's the pastor. Rob's the pastor. So if you say, who's the pastor? It's Rob or Scott. Scott or Rob. Okay, we're both co pastors Co means same. We're equal, all right? So that's the deal. Plurality of leadership. We have pastors. We have elders, plural. We have staff, plural. We have deacons, plural. Part of the strength of this church, this body of believers, is that we have plural leadership. Okay? That's how that, that works. So going forward, we're going to flesh that out, and you know, we'll see what, where God takes us with all that. So let's go back to where we started today, and that is... Are you growing spiritually? First of all, does God want you to grow spiritually? Yes. Yes. The second question is, are you growing spiritually? Really and truly. Not just, well, yeah, you know, I attend church. I read my Bible every once in a while. 
I mean, are you really pursuing Jesus as the center point of your life? I mean, is he really what you're about? And if not, that's okay. It's good to be honest with yourself. And if he's not really that important to you, and he's not really kind of what you're about just yet, what say you be honest with yourself and go, no, he's never, he's really not. And then I would say, would you open yourself up to letting God speak to you and show you some things about making Christ more and more the center point of your life? It's not going to happen overnight. You're not going to make one decision and then boom, you're there. It's going to be a series of decisions that you make day by day in choosing to put him first in your life. Rob talked about it in your finances a few minutes ago. That's just one area of your life. Jesus doesn't want to be added to your life. Jesus is not like an ingredient you add to your life recipe. Jesus wants to be your life. Because he knows if he is your life, that's going to be the best version of you. And and you're not going to be bored. And you're not going to be disappointed. You're going to be disappointed and you're going to be bored if you choose not to follow him. That's what he's trying to get us to avoid. Okay, so let's bow our heads and close our eyes. You know, it's costly to follow Jesus. But it's more costly not to. If you're watching online or you're in this room this morning and you're saying to yourself, you know, Scott, I've listened to this and I I think that's really what I should do. It's what I ought to do. But to be honest with you, I don't really want to. I just don't have the desire. And you got a lot of reasons for that. And God understands that. So what do you do? Are you just like left out? Or is there something for you? What do you do if you don't have something God wants you to have? Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be open to you. In other words, he wants to give you what he wants you to have. You need to ask him for it. You need to trust him for it. And this is critical. Listen, this statement is critical. Feelings follow actions. Feelings follow actions. Where the will goes, the heart follows. So if you're waiting till you feel like following Jesus, you probably are never going to get there. You have to go ahead and take the step and do the right thing. And what you find is when you take the step, the feelings follow. That's how it works. Father, this morning I want to pray for my friends, my brothers, my sisters in Christ. We're starting a new year. We'd like a better version of ourselves, a better you in 2022. Lord, we want to we, help us understand it's not just something that you do to us. We don't just, you don't just zap us and, and then all these things happen in our lives. But you're inviting us on a journey where we make Jesus the center point of our lives. And as we do that day by day, you change us, you transform us from the inside out. You grow us spiritually. And these things that you talk about, these good things from your word, the results happen in our lives and so many other things. Lord, help us to get past our fear. Help us to get past our mindset of, yeah, you know, I've tried to change, but I can't change. Lord, help us to trust you to change us. Help us to take small steps in order to be changed. And Father, this whole process begins with accepting your son as our Savior. We can't grow spiritually if we're not even spiritually alive. To come to life spiritually, we've got to recognize that we're sinners. We've sinned and that our sin separates us from you. And recognizing that that sin that separates us from you is the reason Jesus came. And he died on a cross and he paid for our sins when he died. Three days after he was buried, after death, he rose from the grave. He is alive today. He has defeated sin. He's defeated our sin. And now he's inviting us to trust him. You're inviting us, Lord, to simply believe what you did for us was sufficient to pay for our sins. And it was. You're not asking us to clean up our life. You're not asking us to make a bunch of promises we can't keep. 
you're asking us to trust you to do what we can't do for ourselves. Give us faith to believe you this morning. As we start this new year off, and we do want to better us in 2022, Lord, help us to realize that it begins by surrendering our lives to you and inviting you into our heart to forgive us and help us change. So if you're here this morning and you're listening to this or you're watching online and you're listening to this and you want to start over, you want a fresh start with God, you want God to come into your life through Jesus Christ and forgive you, then I'm going to lead you in a prayer and we're simply going to ask him to do what he promised to do. And so if you want Christ in your life, repeat after me. Pray this prayer, not to me, but to Jesus. From your heart, say to him, say, dear Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you are God's son, the savior of the world. I believe that you died on a cross for the sins of all the world, including mine. I trust you. I believe in you. Come into my life this morning. Save me from my sins. Help me to change. Help me to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer, the Bible says that you are saved. You went from death to life spiritually. And nothing weird happened. And you may not sense that anything happened. But if you were lost and you invited Christ into your life, the change will begin to take place on the inside. It's not about you trying harder. It's about what he's done for you. And so if you've prayed and asked Christ into your life, would you do me a small favor? There should be a blue card in front of you. It's called a connection card. If you would just pull that out, there should be a writing instrument there beside it. And just look on there and check, I prayed to receive Christ this morning. Put your name on there and let us know that that's you so we'll be able to follow up with you. Here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to hound you. We're not going to chase you. We're not going to try to pressure you to do anything. It's just that you started a journey today if you accepted Christ. And the church's goal, our, our purpose is to help you in that journey. So if that's you, put your name on there. We'll follow up with you. We'll be praying for you. And we'll see where God takes this thing. Mr. Nick, would you come and close us out? God bless you. Looking forward to a great year with you this next year.